Well, hello there. Welcome to this restoration video of an old Craftsman block grinder. This one, as you can see, is a three-quarter horsepower bench grinder. It's also a commercial bench grinder, as you can see on the label at the top there, Craftsman Commercial. All that means is that it is dual voltage capable, so it can run on 115 household voltage or 230 volt if you're in a shop setting. Other grinders, other bench, other Craftsman bench grinders, block grinders, they just run on 115. Not, no other difference really besides that. Also, this one has, looks like some sort of a stock dowel cutting system on there. It can be replaced with a regular grinding wheel, of course. And over here we've got, I don't know what happened to that IA shield. That must be a heck of a story. What went down with that? We're going to trash it anyway, so not a big deal there. So, all right, so why don't we just fire this guy up and see how she sounds in just a second. And away we go. Oh man, was that awful. There's obviously something wrong with one of the bearings, or maybe both in there. So we're going to get this thing outside, start taking it apart. We'll give it the whole redo, new bearings, new paint, new everything. So stick around, we're going to have a lot of fun with this project, and it's going to sound and look a lot better than this. Okay, we've got the grinder outside, and the first order of business is to remove the center section. There are four screws holding it in place. Two, two in the front, and then there are two in the rear. So we'll just get started on that right now. Uh, these are simple... Um, Single slot screwdriver, no Phillips head screws on that. So it'll come out pretty easily there. No big deal. Now we'll switch over to the rear after we get the first two out, after fast forwarding a little bit. We'll take these guys out. Again, just two of them here. Same thing, flat head screw. No big deal. We'll do that, and then we're going to take care of the wheel guard in a second. Okay, wheel guard time. Here we go. So we got those two bolts out in the front and rear. Now there are four bolts on each wheel guard here. Take a look at this slowly. Again, these are flathead screws. Nothing, nothing fancy here at all. So we got one there, got another. Now, what I like to do when I take these screws out and after I get the wheel guard off, I'll put the screws back in their slots. That way there's no chance that I lose these things uh, in case I put the project aside for a while. You know, even the best case scenario, these things take a few days. And, you know, if you get sidetracked, it might take a few weeks, maybe even longer. Uh, during that time, you've got the screws laying around loose, Pretty good odds you're going to lose them. So put them back in the holes. That's my suggestion. Thread them back in there. So we'll just get this thing out here. Um, you know, even this, even this side, you can see the, uh, you can see the um, eye guard there on the left. That's the good one, and it still looks like crap. We're going to replace those. I've got uh, a couple of replacements. Those are cheap. No reason. It, that sort of brittle plastic there, that thing's done. There's nothing you can do to clean it up. Okay, so we got the wheel guard off. Perfect. Now we'll get the wheels off. Yeah, look at that. Nice and dusty. We'll clean that up. No big deal. It still looks pretty decent shape considering it's 40 something years old all right so this one now we're on we're looking at the if you look at the front this is the right hand side of the grinder this these bolts come off the way you expect they're right-handed threaded which means in order to unthread them you go counterclockwise so that's what we're doing here on the other side they're reverse threaded which means you tighten them going counterclockwise and you loosen them clockwise but in this case it's just um, normal bolt on the again on the right hand side to just get those things off and we got the uh Getting the spacers out, all that sort of stuff. Nothing fancy. Nice uh, nice design there from Craftsman. That's great. Our uh, cutoff wheels there. We'll put that aside. Looks in, looks to be in good shape, so we'll uh, we'll hold on to that guy for a while. And then next up, what we're going to do is we're going to take off the uh, the wheel, the, um, pardon me, the, uh, well, I guess you can call it the end bell. It's not much of a bell in this case for the block grinders. Uh, the uh, other part of the um, wheel guard there in just a second. Lifting it up. There are three screws in there. It's hard to see. We'll get to that in a sec. You can sort of see them there. Those are bolts. Uh, we'll get the old ratchet out and take care of it. There's also a, um, a bit of a, um, what am I trying to say, a, a lock washer on there too that we'll remove. We'll show how that goes in just a sec as well. Meantime, let's take the switch out again. This is just a couple of bolts on the front. Get one of those guys undone and we'll do the other one. We'll thread the bolt through and then we can take that center guard, that center uh, section off. And we can see some of the wiring. We'll see the stator. We'll get access to it. So in just half a second, we'll get that again. So far, you know, no, no rocket science here. Just a couple of bolts, a couple of, couple of screws. Again, we'll put these back into the uh, switch when we're done with them again so we don't lose it. So we'll just push that through. No problem. There, that comes off. Looking good. And there's our stator. Looks to be in very good shape. Uh, we've got some wiring on the bottom. We've got the switch. We'll take pictures of all the switches, all the wiring in there, just so we don't get confused. I also like to color code things, so I get a little enamel paint out and color mark each where the wire comes from and where it plugs into. Just a little, you know, red, white, 
yellow enamel paint. That way you don't, again, and notice here, by the way, I'm screwing those back in so we don't lose them. All right, let's continue in just a sec. All right, before anything else, I'm removing the ground wire from the cord. That's what you see me sort of unscrewing there on the side. Sorry about the camera work there. It got cut off a little bit, but you can get the idea. The green wire going in there that's being grounded on the side of the grinder. Simple flathead screw again. Most of these are flathead screws. Uh, a few a few Phillips head screws, not too many. Get that sucker out. Take care of that. Again, we're just towards so you notice. Put that sucker back in. Otherwise, you're going to be chasing it down, especially if this thing's sitting around for a few weeks. If you're doing things on the weekend, nights, you know, the kids get in the way, distractions, things like that, you know, you've got to go to recitals or ball games or whatever the deal is. Get this stuff back in there that way, no problem. Okay, so we'll continue on in just a second. Get this stuff back in there that way, no problem. Okay, so we'll continue on in just a second. All right, let's get the inner wheel guard off. There are three bolts there, no big deal. Just get a ratchet out. I forget what size those are. Um, maybe 3 16 quarter inch bolts, something like that. Uh, pretty easy to remove. Just three of them there. Do a little ratcheting there. I'll show you what uh, what I meant before when I said the uh, lock washer. I actually meant there's a snap ring in place. We'll show that in just a second. In the meantime, let's get these bolts out. And of course, with all bolts, once I remove them, I'll put them, thread them back in their holes as soon as I can. Just uh, so again, so you don't lose them. I'll, I'll keep harping on that because it's happened to me before, and it's not a good feeling when it does happen. All right, so we'll just get those suckers out, loosen them up, pull that wheel guard off. There we go, easy. So thread it around, and off it comes. All right, now let's look at the snap ring. There it is, right there. So we're gonna get some pliers out and remove that in just a second here. Put those bolts back in. In the meantime, again, threading them back in place. Uh, wheel guard, yeah, it looks pretty good, you know, again, considering it's 40 years old, plus, well, <laughs> the eye shield looks like junk, but we'll get rid of that. All right, snap ring, here we go. Get that in, nice and lined up. Put that in, okay, make sure it's going the right direction. Never hurts to do that. There we go, give it a good squeeze, and, oh, oh wouldn't you know it, I snapped the tip on the snap ring plier. Oh, cheap, oh, great, oh, yeah. These things happen, all right, so I've, luckily I've got another pair, a stronger pair, so we'll get that snap ring off in just a second. Meantime, i got to get in touch with customer service and get a replacement tip. All right, we've got things inside now. We've got the centerpiece off. We've got the wheel guards off. Now let's separate the two halves. I'm taking a flathead screwdriver here. This is gently wedging them apart, turning the screwdriver, not using there. So we'll get those guys off. There are sections on the bottom and the top. We'll just turn those things gently. Bottom and the top. We'll just turn those things gently. And once the screwdriver's not wide enough, get a pry bar out and start doing the same thing there. Again, slowly back and forth. No need for any force. No need to take any great strain or anything like that. This will come apart. And once you think you've got it wide enough, once it's loose enough, you should be able to separate them by hand, as I'll do in a second. Give these things a good tug. And, oh, there we go. Came off. No problem. Beautiful. Yes, thumbs up. So now that that's off, let's take a look at the bearing and the rotor. So the bearings there, you can't hear this, but you don't want to hear it because it, sound, it, it sounds terrible. Scratchy and stuck. Time for it to go. Meantime, for the rotor, we take a look at that. Notice the fins are on the left-hand side as you're facing, so let's keep that orientation in mind for when we put it back together. Now let's continue. Next up, let's get the rotor out of here. Now the way I'm going to do it, I'm going to take a small sledgehammer and a piece of wood and tap on the side of the rotor. Obviously, I'm not going to hit that directly on the threads, using the sledgehammer, I'm going to destroy the threads if I do that. So a nice wood block there, easy, gentle taps. <clears throat> this is about a, I think a three, three and a half pound sledgehammer, so no need to go crazy or anything like that. So keep tapping it, make sure, also make sure you don't hit your knuckles as you're doing it. There we go, popped it out. Nice, okay. Let's get that thing set up. Notice again the threads, I mean, sorry, the fins on the rotor are pointing to the left. We'll keep that in mind as you're facing forward for when we put it back together. So pull that sucker out and let's see what we got here. So we've got a felt washer there and a wavy washer. Notice, pay attention to the orientation of those as well for when you put it back in. Same on both sides, felt and then a wavy washer. Keep that there. Let's see, same thing on that side. And you could tell you yeah, that bearing there. You can't hear it, it's just scratching. The other one, the one on the right is out of grease, which is bad enough, but that one's really scratchy right there. All right, our next step here is to get the right-hand side of the grinder body off of the stator. 
There are four through bolts actually that go through the stator to the right hand of the body of the grinder. Again, if you're as you're looking forward, that's the orientation here, right hand side. So we pull one out there, great. So there's four of them. So let's fast forward for just a sec. There we go. We're just getting the last one out right now. These are flathead screws. No rocket science here. We'll just pull that out in just a sec. You can see one of the holes, through bolt holes on the top right there. There we go. Put those aside. We'll put them back into the grinder body, the right-hand side of the body, in just a bit. Meantime, let's wedge that stator out of there. Just give it a few tugs. No big deal here. Of course, we've already disconnected all the wiring from one side to another, so there's no point. There's no chance we're going to pull anything out, disconnect any wiring accidentally. So we'll get that out. Oh, just a sec. And there we go. Wedge it out. Beautiful. There we go. All right. So we've got things all set. Well, the body's looking pretty good, though, i got to say, for a 40-year-old grinder. All right, so let's move on to the next step. All right, everything's disassembled. Now we're going to start stripping this thing for paint. I've got an angle grinder here with a paint stripping wheel on it, a woven wheel. I think that's fiberglass on it. It works great for this kind of thing. Much better than, say, a wire wheel. Uh, although that has its place, too, especially for the small nooks and crannies that this thing can't get to. But notice how it's just lifting the paint right off. It leaves very few scratch marks in there. Works great. Uh, again, for the large size areas, in, you know, again, for the nooks and crannies, you're going to have to get out a little bit of sandpaper, scuff it up, do the best you can. Uh, before I did any of this, of course, I sprayed it all with uh, brake cleaner to get all the grease and the grime from 40 years of use out of there first. And once I did that, just go to town on this guy right here. And this gets stripped down pretty quickly, actually. Uh, it's, it's the most tedious part of the whole job. Um, meantime, here's another side, just a, another quick example going through. Paint's coming right off. Again, I cleaned this off beforehand with uh, some brake cleaner and uh, uh, what did I use? I used a uh, piece of uh, uh, a wire, not down a wire wheel, but a wire brush and some, look at that pink. Uh, I, I was using a wire brush and some scouring uh, pad stuff, you know, uh, uh, maroon scotch bright pads, things like that. Whatever gets the job done, get it clean and then hit it with this guy right here. Notice how it's just taking the paint right off. It's great going through there and then what I'm going to do when I'm done I'm going to spray this with some epoxy primer I use uh, a epoxy primer from a company called Southern Polyurethanes SPI they're known as they're great stuff if you're interested very sandable primer get things nice and smooth then I'm going to use some Summit Racing paint they're metallic silver and then I'm going to hit it with some Summit Racing clear coat afterwards you don't have to go that far you can use you know you spray some primer on it from your auto parts store five dollar can or whatever and then use some Rustoleum paint, if you like. I just like to go a little bit more uh, into things. I've got the spray guns and all that for it. If you don't, if you just have, you know, you don't have that equipment, don't worry about it. Rustoleum's fine for this. You can even get a uh, clear coat in a can as well if you don't have any of that uh, laying around. But I'm going to use some Summit Racing stuff. So we'll continue in just a second here. Very quickly, and I'm just going to show how quickly I can take the label off this guy. I've got a replacement label on order. There's a a uh, very helpful gentleman at uh, a place called the Garage Journal, which is an online forum for tool restorations and just folks who want to talk about this sort of thing. Uh, they've got a full discussion forum on the Craftsman Block Grinder here. So if you kind of just want to drop by there, take a look at the Vintage Tools thread, you'll have all kinds of experts on there. They help me out a lot on this project. So thanks there, guys. Anyway, one fellow there actually prints out the labels for you and will send them to you for a very modest fee. So that's very appreciated. Uh, a gentleman named Matt. So thanks, Matt. Right now, though, we're going to get that old label off, and look how quickly this woven wheel just takes all that stuff off, taking off all the paint as well. Again, I said I'm going to spray this with some single-stage urethane paint from Summit Racing. They're silver metallic, and then I'll hit it with some of their clear coat just for extra toughness. Uh, single-stage urethane is terrific as far as toughness and scratch resistance, and if you put some clear coat on there as well, it uh, works even better and very nice and shiny. We'll see that in the end. Again, if, you're just, if you don't have any of that equipment, you don't want to have that budget, Although it doesn't cost that much to get that kind of paint. Um, you know, rust oleum's fine. Uh, just put that on there. And you can, if you want to get some uh, spray, uh, spray uh, clear coat in a can, that's fine too. They've got all kinds of solutions there. If you and I would recommend spending $10, $20 for a can of Spray Max 2 Component Clear. That's very tough. That's just like almost, in fact, the automotive collision industry uses that stuff for spot repairs. Very tough, very shiny. I recommend it very highly if you've got twenty dollars to spare on that if you don't don't worry about it again just put some rustoleum on there after you prime it and you should be good to go but again just uh taking this stuff off you can see the other parts that i finished there on the i finished there on the upper right 
Uh, again, there are certain sections there I couldn't get with this thing because it's too bulky, too wide to get in those nooks and crannies. I'll take some sandpaper and take care of that. And we should be good to go then. Uh, so we'll get this thing all straightened out in just a second. Just a moment. All right, I figured just for grins, we're going to take a look at these bearings. I pulled them out, cleaned them up. This one here is on the um, was on the left side. This one's on the right side. You can see that. It just has a number 503. I don't know what that means. There's some writing on here, very faint. It almost looks like the lettering's backwards for some reason. Nothing there. Nice job, guys. Uh, so we're going to crack these open. First, let's spin them. Here's the one that was on the right-hand side. You can see that goes pretty... Fairly quiet. You can hear some clicking though. It's definitely a tired bearing. And this is the guy that was on the left hand side. We heard that one before. Let's listen to it now. Yeah. Pretty pretty nasty stuff. So we'll crack these guys open and see what we can find inside. You know what? Let's forget about the old bearings. They're tired. They're finished. Let's go on to the new. So the question is, how do you do this? Well, if you haven't done this before, you take a piece of galvanized pipe, put a cap on it, put some tape on there to keep marring to a minimum, and get your new bearing out. And what you're going to do is tap that onto the inner race, that part I'm circ that's circling right there. That's the only place you want to hit it. Put that thing on there. Fits great. Make sure it fits right. And usually half-inch galvanized pipe will work. What you don't want to do is tap it on anything other than that inner circle, the inner race. You tap it on the center or the upper lip, upper the outer race, you're going to wind up ruining the bearing. So make sure it's only that part I'm circling, the inner, the inner race. Again, half-inch galvanized pipe should work fine for that. Uh, again, we put the rotor on that soft block of wood right there. That way we don't ruin the threads on the rotor as we tap this in. We'll talk about all this in just a second. I just want to give a quick overview of what this is going to look like. All right, let's install the bearings now. I put the rotor in the freezer for about 30 minutes to cool it down, make it contract. I put the bearings on a light bulb for about five minutes each to make them expand, which will make this easier to install. So let's put this guy on here for a start. And that one's not quite fitting on the way, so we'll have to tap it on. But if we try the other side really quickly, we might get lucky. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. This one, unfortunately, you can't see it. The one on the bottom slid right on. So go figure that here. Again, taking our pipe, hitting it on that inner race, making sure things are lined up properly. Nice, gentle taps. You don't have to go crazy on this. Take a look at your progress every few taps. Make sure everything's lined up. We're not quite there. We'll keep going, tapping again. It helps a lot that the bearing's heated up, which is, again, why I'm wearing those gloves, because it's pretty hot right now. Tapping those things on, and with the rotor contracting because it was in the freezer, it makes this a lot easier. So we'll keep tapping. It makes this a lot easier. So we'll keep tapping. And a couple more, and I think we'll be in business here. So you get the idea here. Just gentle taps. Again, that galvanized pipe works. It's half-inch galvanized pipe. For larger bearings, three-quarter-inch galvanized pipe works great. All right, I think we're in business there. Things are s nice and smooth. We're in business. Let's move on to the next step. All right, next up, you'll notice I have a new label here. The old one was sacrificed as part of the paint stripping process. It was old and cruddy, so whatever. So I picked, picked up this one off the garage journal. There's a gentleman there named Matt Blast, a member there who has a printer that prints out these kinds of things. Uh, they're terrific. You send him a photo of the old label, and he can recreate it using CAD software or whatever. This is about 20 bucks, and it was money well spent. The label is very tough, very sticky, very wonderful, so definitely worth getting, at least for me. Maybe you should consider the same. All right, in other restoration videos, I've shown the painting process, and I didn't want to bore anybody by basically showing the same thing three times. Uh, but if you're interested, though, what I used here was an epoxy primer from Summit Racing, which is about $20 a quart. I then used their silver metallic paint, also about 20 bucks a quart. You need to get uh, a pint of activator. Uh, that's about, I think, $15. Actually, no, it's $15 a quart. Um, you know, this sounds like a lot of money, and if you don't want to spend it, by all means, just go with some Rust-Oleum primer and paint. You should be fine. But you can see the result here. Very shiny, very nice, and very, very scratch resistant. I also used a little bit of Summit Racing's uh, two-component clear coat as well, just for, again, shiny gloss and more scratch resistance. There's a, if you don't have access to a spray gun like I do, and if you don't have any paint laying around like I did, these urethane paints, um, you can, again, use Rust-Oleum. You can use also, there's a, um, a terrific clear coat and a spray can from a company called Spraymax. It's, it's used in the automotive industry, in fact, and it's fantastic stuff. Almost, as, I mean, actually, it is as good as the Summit Racing clear coat I used, the two component stuff. And that's because this is, the Spraymax is a two component product as well. Very tough finish. If you're concerned about gloss and scratch resistance, 
I can I can't recommend it highly enough if you don't have access to spray gun equipment. It's about twenty dollars a can if I recall. Uh, one caveat: if you are spraying rust-oleum, make sure that dries completely before you use any sort of clear coat. The reason for that is oil-based paints like rust-oleum take a while to gas off, and if you do if you spray over it with a clear coat beforehand and the paint is still degassing over time, it's going to yellow out the finish. So give it a you know a week or two weeks even for the paint completely to completely dry. You don't need to wait that long. If you're using a single-stage urethane paint, most likely a day or so. And if you're going even fancier, say a base coat, clear coat procedure, and anybody who's painted cars knows what I'm talking about, that you can put the clear coat on about an hour later. But again, if you're using Rust-Oleum, wait the full week, two weeks, just to play it safe, and then go for the clear coat on top of that. Okay, we've got the bearings installed on the rotor. Let's talk about the wiring for just a moment. Notice I've got a, an orange marking there. I haven't talked about this much. Orange marking for that next to that blade terminal. That lines up to the orange marking on this yellow wire coming off the stator. I had to put this aside for a couple of weeks, and I'm glad I marked this stuff, because if I hadn't, I'd be lost. Notice also on the star capacitor, I've got a white mark there. That translates to the wire, again, coming off the stator with the white mark on there. Just some simple enamel paint, some testers enamel, and a small brush. Notice, you can't see this very well, there's a green marking, some green paint right there on the other terminal on the stator, on, on the uh, capacitor, and that lines up with that wire right there from that uh, block that was coming out there. Again, if I hadn't done this, and I waited a few weeks to come back to this, be in big trouble. Uh, and also, of course, take a, make sure, take as many pictures as you need to. Again, over here we've got a blade terminal with a yellow marking on it. That in turn lines up to another wire on the stator, I believe, with a yellow mark on there. Again, just all just all I can say is document there it is. Just document all this stuff as best you can. Photos and videos. It's time well spent. You will sell, save yourself a lot of trouble. Okay, let's keep going. All right, here's a tip that's going to save you a lot of trouble. You notice I've got four rods going through the stator holes. Uh, this is to line the stator up with the right hand side of the block. Remember we had to unscrew it before. This is some six thirty second threaded rod, about a foot long. What I'm doing is I'm putting it through those holes, making sure they go into the side of the grinder. Because these bolts themselves, the ones that you actually screw in, they don't fit all the way in until you press the stator all the way on. And if you haven't got it lined up when you do that, and it's easy to misalign, you can't get the holes in there. So what you want to do is take this threaded rod, put it through, make sure it's going through through the stator fine into the, into the holes on the side of the grinder, and then press the stator in like I just did. That way you know you've got things lined up. So that's great. So we're going to take one of these threaded rods out right now. So it's pressed in, and we know it's lined up, and that way we can take this through bolt, Thread it in through the stator and attach the stator to the side of the grinder. Everything's lined up. And that's great. This is so important. If you don't have this lined up just right, the rotor's not going to fit properly. Things are going to bind up as you try to turn the rotor. It's a real mess. So this is a nice way to get things lined up. Got this from a tip from a buddy, oh, again, over at the Garage Journal. So, again, that's a great resource to go to if you want to learn this sort of thing. Notice right now we're just able to put those bolts in. No problem. We'll tighten this thing up, and we'll move on in just a second. All right, now that we've got the stator installed into half of the housing, it's time to put the rotor in place. Notice here I'm getting the washers out. I've got the felt washer there that goes in first. I know that because I documented it beforehand. Make sure you place it just right. If these things aren't lined up properly, the rotor's not going to go through right, and it's going to bind up when you start turning it, so that's not good. So again, take your time, get that thing in place, and we've got a wavy washer. Also, when you're disassembling this, Note which way the washer, that wavy washer, is facing, where the fingers press against the bearing. It'll save you a lot of trouble down the road. And it doesn't take any time to do that. So we'll get this up, and... Oops, looks like the... Yeah, that wavy, that felt washer fell out, so let's get that out. Put it in and try again. There we go. All right. We've got all those washers in place. We're holding it closely. Let's slide that rotor in nice and easy. It's like a game of operation. Also notice I've got the fins there facing up on the rotor. That's important when you disassemble this. Make sure you know which orientation the fins are going, uh, whether on the left or the right on the front of the grinder when you disassemble it. These things are balanced at the factory. They're oriented that way, left or right, for a reason. So just replicate that when you put it together. Otherwise, you might wind up with a unbalanced rotor. And who needs that? So again, a few seconds of time uh, at the start documenting this, and you should have no problem. Now right here, I'm pulling the rotor through, trying to seat that bearing. I'm doing it gently, nice and easy. Getting it in place. Is it, is it binding up as I turn it? Probably is at this point, because we need to seat it a little better. 
I know I'm pushing on the back of the rotor trying to get that thing fitted in there. Close, close. So we're going to have to reach for the few gentle taps. Again, I'm, I am using a soft blow hammer. Do not use a hard hammer on this. You're going to ruin the threads on the end of the rotor. So soft blow, nice and easy, gentle taps. You don't have to go at 60 miles an hour on that. You don't have to go at 60 miles an hour on that. Nice and steady. You'll get it in eventually. That's about a two or three pound hammer. So eventually that bearing is going to seat. And as you do that, periodically check to make sure it's not binding. If it is, if it is binding, and it could very well happen the first time through because these things are very close fits, so don't be discouraged. But if it does bind, knock it back out a little bit, try seating it again. Eventually you'll get it through. So here I'm just putting on the final touches. Again, nice and easy hammering. And we'll check again. Is it binding? No, it feels smooth. So we'll go on to the next section here. All right, with the rotor and the stator installed in one half of the grinder, it's easy enough to put the second half on. We use these through bolts to line things up, rather these threaded rods, so that when it comes time to put the through bolts in, uh, everything will be lined up properly. Putting the second side of the grinder on, easy enough. Just put it in there, on, slide it on, a few taps of the soft blow hammer in your business. And whew, Sorry about the camera work here. Jeez, I don't know what happened there. But you get the idea. Once we tap these things together, we're ready to put the through bolts in and start tightening this thing up. All right, with the two halves installed, we can start taking these through bolts out once we check that the rotor isn't binding and it's not. It's nice and smooth there, so that's great. And again, with those through bolts, we know with those, sorry, with that threaded rod going through the each of the bolt holes, we know that these through bolts are going to fit in from one side to the other just fine. So we'll show that in just a sec. We'll take out that top piece of threaded rod. Note the through bolt just goes in and the holes are already lined up because we use that threaded rod, which is absolutely nothing worse than getting these two halves together pounding them together and realizing that the holes from one side to the other don't match up and those through bolts aren't going to go through. So again, that's what the point of that threaded rod is. So now we've got that in there, so we're now going to start tightening up the top through bolt. Get a couple of ratchets lined up there. Get things in place, nice and easy here. Put that nut on the end, start it off by hand. Okay, good. Now we've got that going, so we'll start that. We've got the first one in. Now we're going to put the second through bolt in. And what we're going to do here is we're going to tighten these things up. If you've ever used, if you've ever done any automotive work uh, on gaskets, for instance, you know that you don't just tighten one bolt down and then go to the other, and then another, and then another. You do it in, in cycles. So you go in a, some sort of clockwise or counterclockwise pattern and put on a little torque on each bolt, then go around, put a little more torque on all the bolts, and then go around for a third go and then put more torque to the final torque on there. Well, same idea here. The point of that is that you don't want to bolt things down too much, one bolt versus the others, because then things are going to be uneven. Uh, the, the torque values are going to be uneven, and you're going to wind up with binding. Again, these, these are very close fit machines right here, so the tolerances are not, I mean, they're very sensitive. So you've got to make sure that you've got equal force on each of these bolts. And the best way to do that is to torque them down slowly, one at a time, then come back torque down each one a little bit more. That way you know you're getting equal values of torque on, on all the bolts here. So again, I'm starting now with the third one. I won't bore you with all the going through each bolt, torquing down each one. That's kind of boring. You get the idea, though. Go, through, go in cycles, torque down each one slowly. Don't tighten one down all the way and then go to the next one and try to tighten that down all the way. It doesn't work very well. You're going to wind up with binding in the rotor because things aren't even somewhere. One of these bolts doesn't get torqued down enough, whereas the others get torqued down too much relative to it, and you wind up with trouble. So nice and easy. Go in a little torque on one bolt, one bolt, and a little on another, and just keep going until everything's tied down, and you shouldn't have any problems at all. All right, one final check before we put the lid on this thing, the front and the buttons, and secure all the wiring. Let's make sure the rotor is spinning good. It is. We've got our through bolts torqued down evenly across the board. Everything's nice and tight. Looks good. Check the wiring, it's all installed there. We've got the capacitor wiring in there. All the wires that go to the capacitor are set up. The only ones that aren't left are the ones for the power cord. So we'll get all that lined up and we are in the home stretch. All right, we're almost there. I've got one of the inner wheel guards on. I'm just tightening up the three bolts there. Same idea as with the, uh, putting the two halves of the grinder together again. Just tighten these things up in a cycle. You don't have to go all the way on one, then all the way in the other. Just tighten up first bolt a little bit, then the second one, then the third, then go back and continue cycling. It should take about two or three tries 
before you get it all in. Notice I'm just going back and forth on each of these guys. Nice and even torque values on each. It just saves you a lot of trouble. All right, let's speed things up here a little bit. We're putting the snapping on at five times normal speed. Notice I'm just getting the pliers on, putting in that groove there in the middle. That way, when you do that, we can put the grinding wheel on, the flange, all that, and we'll be all set to go. There, it's in place. We're all set now. Okay, at this point, we're just putting the flanges on, getting that grinding wheel on, bolting things on. There, we're getting the nut on there. We're almost there, so close. Just thread that sucker on, and we'll be all set. All right, last but not least, the wheel guard. Oh, look how shiny that is. That clear coat really pays off. All right, just a few flathead screws here, and we are in business. Get this thing on, and then we'll take it outside and fire it up and see how she sounds. All right, let's fire this thing up. Look at that, spinning like a top, nice and quiet, much quieter than before. Looks glossy, runs great. I even repainted that red button you see there. So that came out nicely. I hope this. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it helps you if you have your own grinder you're trying to restore. These block grinders are terrific machines. They can last for years if you treat them right. So again, thanks so much for watching us with me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Click the like button if you enjoyed it. And uh, good luck with your own restorations. And thanks again for watching.